Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are now starting the session for the School of Chemistry and Physics. Um, I've got feedback that my voice is distorting. I do apologize. I don't know why it's doing it. I've put my cell phone as far away as possible. And I did have headphones, but my daughter has run away with them. So too bad. Uh, please bear with me and I hope it will improve. So welcome to the School of Chemistry and Physics. Uh, let me just give some ground rules. If you're just joining us now, um, we are live streaming on Facebook. If you have friends who have not registered and want to watch there, uh, please visit our Open Day website where there are all sorts of interesting materials. There are videos, there's brochures, there's application information. There is uh, funding information, the aptitude tests. There's all sorts of very worthwhile resources. So that's the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science Open Day webpage, if you Google that. Uh, webinar rules, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. If you have any questions you want to post, please type them in there. Don't type questions into the chat because they get lost and the panelists won't see them. If you want to ask your question in Zulu, that's fine. Uh, we can we have someone who can answer in Zulu. So I think that's from that's it from me. I'd like to hand over to Prof. Ross Robinson, who is the Dean and Head of the School of Chemistry and Physics. Ross, over to you. Ah, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Sorry, my microphone was muted there. Thank you, Sally, for the, the kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted this morning to, to be able to share with some of my colleagues uh, some of the, the research and, and the material that we cover in our undergraduate uh, courses and our postgraduate studies within the School of Chemistry and Physics. Uh, this morning I'm joined with uh, three of my colleagues, Dr. Tishana Singh, she's an analytical chemist uh, based on the Durban campus, Dr. Nkosnati uh, Dlamini, he's a physicist in, in Westhall, uh, in, sorry, in Peter Maritzburg and Professor Thomas Conrad, who's also a physicist uh, and the academic leader for the physics cluster on the Westville campus. So just briefly a little bit about our school. Um, one is able to study um, chemistry and physics on, on both the Peter Maritzburg and the Durban Westville campus from first year, second year, third year. So you can obtain your undergraduate degree in either of the disciplines. Uh, on both campuses, and you can continue to do your honors, masters, or PhD. And you can see there's two pictures of our buildings uh, on, on the two campuses. Uh, just a little bit about us. So we, we're very well um, equipped. We've got fantastic laboratories uh, on, on both campuses. There's a picture of our, our latest laboratory. It's a, a peptide research laboratory. Um, we've got about 60 academic staff within the school. Uh, many of them are NRF rated scientists. Uh, we've got a fantastic support and technical team who are there to make sure that our, our practicals, our research laboratories are all running and being well looked after. Uh, we've got a very large undergraduate class of about 2000 students. And we have about 600 postgraduate students also within our school. One of the things we pride ourselves in is that of our postgraduate students, a lot are from or many of them are from uh, outside of the South African border. So we've got students from uh, the United States, Germany, other countries like that, and also from the African continent. In our school, we have state of the art research equipment, and this allows us um, to provide a, a um, platform where a lot of collaboration takes place. Um, and you can see this is a, a photograph of one of our newest pieces of equipment, it's a plasma laser deposition uh, instrument. It's used to make thin films, which is used in our nanomaterials uh, research groups uh, for things like uh, photovoltaic systems, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, our school is also um, not isolated and it's just not based in, in KwaZulu-Natal. We've got lots and lots of international uh, linkages with research groups all around the world, the United States, China, Korea, Germany, uh, and the United Kingdom. And just in the last uh, few months, we've just uh, 
established a partnership with a university in Jamaica, and likewise uh, another partnership with the university in Kenya. So that's just a, a kind of a, a snapshot of, of uh, a bit about the school. My colleagues, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the undergraduate programs that we've got. So following on now, I'm going to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Tishana Singh. And I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers with you. Uh, Dr. Tishana Singh um, is, as I indicated, an analytical chemist based on our Westville campus, and, and she will just tell you a little bit about the chemistry side of our program. Thank you, Tishana. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, yes, so as Prof has said, my name is uh, Tishana Singh, and I am based on the Westerville campus. So I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about the degree and what it entails. But firstly, before I do that, um, I know uh, there are well, mostly uh, people in school that are watching this and you are faced at the moment with a lot of um, questions, uh, pressurizing questions about uh, what to do, what to study and uh, what exactly, what career you exactly want to uh, pursue. Uh, and that is, uh, it's very important to choose uh, the correct uh, course. So um, in this uh, uh, school, uh, while well, the degree that we offer is a BSc in chemistry and applied chemistry, but they are, the university offers various three-year degree programs uh, that can be coupled with a, a major in uh, chemistry. And um, I have to tell you at the outset that you do require a very good uh, passing metric uh, with fairly good marks, uh, both in uh, maths and uh, physical science. So we have a program guide on the website that sets out uh, the two uh, majors, the chemistry major, uh, as well as the applied chemistry. So if you do a BSc degree, uh, you do the courses that are on the left-hand side, which, you, which are your chemistry majors. But if you want, uh, if you specialize uh, in applied chemistry, then you also do the modules that are on the uh, right-hand side. And applied chemistry uh, is, um, uh, it's, it's the uh, modules, in those modules, you actually get to use uh, some of the state-of-the-art equipment that we have uh, in the school. The prof has just showed you pictures of one of them. Um, so if you go to our, uh, uh, the university website, uh, www.ukzn.ac.za, and you click on the tab there, I've got it in a yellow block that says colleges. And in the College of uh, Agriculture, Engineering and Science, you will find uh, the School of Chemistry and Physics. So if you click on that, it will take you to our web page. And most of the information you can find uh, in the tab on the left-hand side that says uh, prospective students. So it has that program guide that I have put up, as well as a lot of other uh, information. And uh, on this page as well, they are lots of links that you can go to uh, and have a look at the pictures and videos and exactly what uh, it entails uh, to study applied uh, chemistry. So if you've chosen applied chemistry or chemistry for that matter, the next question is, so what can I do with uh, a degree in chemistry? Well, there are various fields uh, that you can work in because chemistry is everywhere. Uh, from agriculture, be it uh, the fertilizer that goes uh, to plant the crops as well the her as the herbicides and pesticides uh, in the food industry, be it for the food preservation or, um, or preparation of food, uh, in the medical field, the cosmetic field, uh, all your cleaning agents, your washing powders and detergents, uh, even in um, in the manufacture of appliances, big and small, uh, all forms of transport, uh, ship, rail, car, uh, the oils that go into fuels, the making of uh, parts for cars, as well as paints, and it even goes as far as uh, space. So chemistry is everywhere, and there are a variety of fields that uh, you can go into uh, with chemistry. 
Now in the school, we also have, uh, as with any other university, uh, it's teaching and research and just a few of the research areas uh, that we have in the school. Um, medicinal and natural product chemistry deals with the isolation and extraction of um, uh, compounds from plants that have medicinal uh, benefits. Uh, green chemistry, uh, the group looks at obeying the 12 principles set out in green chemistry, uh, the most important one being to do chemistry in such a way that it does not harm the environment. Then we have analytical uh, chemistry and environmental science that looks at the levels of pollution in the environment and uh, keeping the environment clean. We also have a big catalysis research group that is involved in the design and synthesis of catalysts, uh, mainly for the production of uh, renewable energy. And they are also looking at making catalysts recyclable. And the flagship research uh, platform in the school is the nanotechnology research platform. And Professor uh, Thomas will tell you uh, more about that. Uh, so uh, just a few pictures here of our uh, labs. Uh, these are mainly the first year labs. And as you can see, uh, uh, students um, are wearing their lab coats and uh, safety glasses. So we take safety um, very, very seriously uh, in the labs. You will also see that uh, each student works on their own. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, group work. So you get a chance to work in the lab on your own. Um, and first year and second year, uh, we teach you techniques and guide you through it. So by the time you, uh, in your third, very, very confident uh, and capable of working in a lab or on your own. Uh, so that's all that. I have to say, and I hope I've given you uh, enough information uh, about chemistry. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I will now hand over to uh, Dr. Nkosinati Dlamini. Sorry about that. I was just struggling to unmute myself. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nkosnati Lamini. I'm a lecturer in the physics department at UKZN. I'm based on the Peter Maritzburg campus. And I've been invited here today to speak to you a bit about the physics discipline at UKZN and a bit about what we do with regards to our undergraduate program. So I guess the first question to answer really is, what is physics, right? So physics means different things to different people. The word physics, you might not know, comes from the Greek word physikos, which means nature of natural things. And some people would describe physics as the science of matter, energy, space, and time, which is a very broad description. But I suppose if you wanted to sum it up, not in a technical way, you could say that what physicists do is we study the interactions between matter and energy in the hopes of better understanding the world that we live in. Right now, in this word cloud that you see on the screen currently, all the sort of sub subfields of physics, as well as the concepts that you come across, so you would have seen mechanics, energy, you obviously use some mathematics, etc. And physics is quite nice because it forms the foundation for, and is also connected to all the branches of science and engineering. It's very useful in everyday life. And there are many professions out there, such as chemistry, life sciences, agriculture, engineering, et cetera. The list sort of goes on, but I'm not gonna to spend too much time about it, that rely on the physics background. But right? now you might be asking yourself, okay, but what do you actually study? You say you study, these interactions between energy and matter, but what does that actually mean? Well, I hope to answer that with this slide. So what you see on this slide is the orberus, which is this ancient symbol of a snake eating its own tail. And this symbol, if you look it up in history, was used most notably in alchemy. And for those of you that don't know, alchemy is an ancient branch of natural philosophy and really a precursor to physics. 
as we know today. And one of the most famous alchemists around was Sir Isaac Newton, who is also considered one of the most famous physicists. He was also an alchemist. So what I've shown on the Orberus here is the range of objects and the range of sizes that are governed by the laws of physics and which physicists study, right? So physics gives us this opportunity and it allows us to probe the most extreme parts of the cosmos around us, right? So you can go all the way from these large celestial bodies like galaxies, say solar systems, black holes, planets, moons, etc., etc. You can go all the way from these very, very huge, huge objects all the way down to the very heart of matter itself in the form of these building blocks, these subatomic particles, which are the building blocks of nature, right? So the range of things that you study and the range of topics covered is quite vast. So you go from subatomic to atomic, to cellular, to organisms, to planet size objects and all the way across. And across all these different size scales and energy scales, what physicists do is we probe key questions about nature and we try and find a deeper understanding of why things happen the way they do, what is going on, can we make any future predictions about this vast range of objects that are found in our world. Now, if you come to first year physics, what you'll find is that you're going to be studying a lot of different topics. So what I thought I would do is I would highlight some of the topics that you'll encounter certainly at level one, first year and second year, as well as show you very brief examples of how they are present in your everyday life. So at first year level, when you first arrive, one of the first topics you are introduced to is the topic of mechanics. Now, you are familiar, you should be familiar with mechanics from your grade 11 and grade 12 work, but mechanics is basically the study of forces acting on bodies, whether the bodies are at rest or in motion, doesn't really matter. What we do is we see if I apply a force to this body, what happens to it? Okay, it's more complicated than that, obviously in real life, but that's a nice way to sum it up. So in this example that I've chosen, which is this wonderful looking Nissan GTR4. The mechanics in this case could be, for example, this spinning motion of the wheels, right? Looking at how the contact between the tires and the ground, does it provide enough friction? Is there enough frictional force? Is there enough traction? Can you drive the car? That would be an example of applying mechanics to the design of this car. After your mechanics, you then look at waves and waves is the study of vibrational motion. So again, the car example, you're looking at things like the shock absorbers, how your radio speakers are positioned in the car to ensure maximum sound clarity. You want sound insulation because when you're sitting inside your car, you don't want to hear the engine. You don't want to hear every single noise that's going on outside your car. People shouldn't be able to hear your conversations. And that all falls under the discipline of waves. You then, you then get introduced to the next discipline, which is the discipline of thermodynamics. And here what you do is we study the relationship that exists between heat and other forms of energy. And this leads to some nice things like how to design an efficient engine, how to use coolants to heighten the efficiency of your system and so on and so forth. One of my favorites is electromagnetism. And what we do in electromagnetism is we study the properties of charges and magnetism, so electric charges and magnetism, and we look at the relationship that exists between them, right? It's quite a fascinating field, at least I feel that way. And in the car example, it would be things like the car battery, the starter, the headlights, the ECU control chips, all work under the guise of electromagnetism. Now, there is another topic that you sort of introduce to at first year and you develop as you go further on with your studies. And that is modern physics. Now modern physics is quite a challenging topic. Personally, I view it as the study of the weird stuff, right? It's the weird, I call it the weird stuff because you run into some results that you aren't quite expecting and everything seems strange when you first encounter it. 
So an example of modern physics in everyday life, I could have used the car in terms of the chips that control the car, but I thought I would give a different example for modern physics in everyday life. And to begin with, I'm going to start with the humble transistor. So this piece of electronics known as the transistor was invented by three physicists. I think it was Bratton, Bardeen, and Shockley. And they actually won the Nobel Prize in 1956, if I'm not mistaken. And it was actually quite an important invention that not many people know about. And the reason that it's so important is that it started off the microelectronics revolution. So you might ask yourself, well, what is the microelectronics revolution? Well, if you look at the world around us today, you interact with microelectronics on an almost daily basis, right? So in things like laptops and things like gaming systems, cell phones, supercomputers, cars, watches, microelectronics filter into just about every aspect of life today. Uh, an example to highlight, I suppose, is going to be if you take the example of a modern computer, almost every part works thanks to the use of some advanced laws of physics. In particular, I'll highlight the chipsets because I'm sure we've all heard of the chipsets, the Core i5 and Core i7 and AMD versus Intel, etc. And these computer chips actually use the laws of quantum mechanics in their transistors, right? They all run off these transistors and they use the laws of quantum mechanics, which is one of these advanced branches of modern physics within the transistor to power all these electronics that have us so connected today. So it's actually quite fascinating. You don't think about it, but physics is just about everywhere and you interact with it on pretty much on a daily basis. Now, what you'll find is while you're prospecting for your subject of choice or the field that you want to study is you'll see that most scientific courses will require you, will either require you or encourage you to often take at least one physics module during the course of your undergraduate studies. And the reason for this is because of the core skills that you learn as you go through a physics module, right? And higher, higher years. So these core skills, I've just highlighted four of them here, are problem solving. So you learn quite well in terms of how to define a problem, having to find a problem, how you analyze it, find solutions, implement the solutions, check whether the solutions work, and so on and so forth. So it's quite a powerful science in that regard. You also learn the nice skills, uh, the skills of analytical and critical thinking. And these involve, say, taking outside knowledge into account when you present with a particular problem, being able to break down complex problems into manageable components, and then maybe use things from different fields or techniques from different fields to solve those. Another important skill that you learn is autonomy and independence. And this allows you to really grow as a researcher, to grow as a, an academic, to grow as a student, to, to grow as a person. Because what you'll find is that through most of your physics courses, your lecturers are not simply going to give you the solutions. Rather, they will give you hints and prods and give you some autonomy and some independence in coming up with your own conclusions. Another key skill is that of communication, because in these days, people don't really work in isolation. So physics is one of the sciences where you need to be very clear and unambiguous about what you're saying. And it's a nice way to learn clear, precise communication as you work in groups, as well as collaborating with various people. Now, these skills are nice because they're transferable, again, to many scientific disciplines. And so during the course of your studies, here with us in physics at least, you're going to be faced with a lot of different problems and you will learn how to be faced, how when faced with a certain problem, you should have picked up the skills and the confidence to find the solution to that particular problem and be able to clearly communicate that solution to the world around you. And because of this reason, you'll often find physicists working in a vast array of careers. Now, when you talk about physicists working in careers, most people assume academia and education, right? So when people think of physicists careers, they often think 
lecturing at universities, teaching at high schools, doing research at universities, or stuff like that. That's often the picture you get when you think of a physicist. But however, the careers that physicists find themselves in, especially these days, are extremely varied. And I've highlighted some unusual examples on this slide here. So one that's I suppose closely linked to academia and education is private research. All right, so you can do private research. I suppose currently the buzzword is SpaceX because of their recent successful launch of astronauts to the International Space Station, but you can end up doing private research for companies like SpaceX, companies like Tesla, Huawei, Cecil, companies at the leading age of innovation who often want to hire physicists and you often find physicists working in those spaces conducting private research. Physicists also have a career in space because in, I think in just about all space programs in all countries around the world from shuttle launches from shuttle launches to communication satellite launches there are physicists involved at least in some part of that chain. If you aren't involved in that, there's still a lot of physicists who apply their skills as astronomers and cosmologists, and they study stars, galaxies, and other objects in space from the ground, right? Now, UKZN is fortunate at the moment in that they've got a fantastic research collaboration with both the South African Space Agency, right, the South African National Space Agency Sensor, as well as the square kilometer array projects that are running, that's running in the Northern Cape. So we've got quite a good link to those. So if you're interested in space physics, it's a good place to look. Another one is the stock market. And it's quite strange to think of physicists in the stock market, but what you see is that as you go through the various levels of physics, you often find yourself using, having to use advanced mathematics to solve problems. And it turns out that some of these mathematical techniques that you pick up during things like um, your mathematical physics can be applied directly to making predictions of the stock market. And strangely enough, physicists are in fairly high demand at financial companies who use their mathematical skills to try and predict the fluctuations in the markets. Another sort of career that people don't really think about when they think about physicists is the career of medicine. So in medicine, it's physics has had countless contributions to the way our modern medicine landscape looks. So quantum mechanics have led to the understanding of various chemical reactions on which basically all our drugs, just all the drug discovery and the drugs that we use in medicine these days are based. You have, for example, a CT scan, which is that machine that allows you to image the inside of your patient, was actually invented by a South African physicist, um, Alan McCormick. And there are other many medical machines, techniques and procedures which owe their existence to physics. So things like x-rays, um, radiation therapy for cancer treatments, ultrasounds for prenatal treatments, pacemakers, MRIs, etc. The last sort of unusual career I'd like to highlight is that of investment banks. And these banks are large banks, which often have a presence across all six continents, and they actually hire quite a lot of physicists. Now, the reason for this is because the physicists that are employed in those institutions are then usually there to undertake economics research, as well as to use their mathematical skills to try and come up with models for the financial world and to try and make money for the banks, obviously, right? So there's some unusual careers I could go on. There are many more unusual careers and career paths that physicists find themselves in. I suppose the take home message here is that if you are thinking about becoming a physicist, know that there is more to physics than just ending up in academia and education. So in closing, I thought it might be a good idea to ask some common questions that you might have already come across in your grade 11 and grade 12, and you might not have seen the answers to yet. So questions such as like, such as why does ice float when it's placed in water? This is a pretty cool one. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest you look it up on YouTube. It's you have a singer and they're singing and holding a crystal glass and the glass shatters. So how, can, how is it that a singer can shatter a crystal glass using only her voice? This one was quite interesting to study for me. It's how does a cat 
almost always land on its feet when it's dropped or when it falls off from say a two-story, three-story building? Why is it that it almost always lands on its feet and is able to walk away? And finally, why does the sky appear blue when the sun is high, so around midday, but red when it's low at sunrise or sunset? Now, I'm not gonna answer these questions in this particular presentation because that's not the purpose of this presentation. However, if you wish to find the answers to these and much more interesting problems, then I suppose I hope to see you in my first year physics class in 2021. And I suppose in closing, just to thank you for your time, for listening to this presentation today. I am now going to hand you over to Professor Thomas Conrad, and he's going to be speaking to you about some of the cutting edge research that is currently taking place in our school. Thank you. Okay, so my name is uh, Professor Thomas Conrad, and I would like to um, talk to you about the research that is done uh, at the School of Chemistry and Physics. And um, so uh, to start with, uh, I can tell you that our research is very versatile. And uh, I want to show you three things. Uh, the first is that um, uh, we uh, do top research, uh, at least in, uh, we are among the top research in the country. And in some cases, we do top research um, uh, among the, uh, in the world, one can say. So um, the second thing is that our research is very applied and uh, relevant to the corresponding industries. And the third point is uh, that I find it very exciting. So let me uh, give you some examples of our research uh, so that you uh, get a picture of what we are doing. And my first example comes from cosmology. Cosmology is the study of the evolution of the universe. And um, I want to give you a small insight by just telling you about the first second in the life of the universe. According to uh, the Big Bang theory, um, the uh, universe started in a point 13.7 billion years ago. And uh, the Big Bang in the beginning was not so big. In fact, the universe was hovering around uh, in a tiny dot uh, of the size uh, much smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So very, very small. And then after a fraction of a second, um, the universe suddenly uh, underwent a phase transition and expanded to nearly the size it has today, uh, which is uh, magnification uh, by uh, 78 orders of magnitude. So that means if you want to get the final size from the initial size, you have to multiply the initial size with a number that has a one and then 78 zeros behind it. So a massive uh, expansion. And in order to give you an insight into uh, what such a phase transition actually is, I would like to quote another example of a phase transition. And uh, you might know this one. It's the phase transition of water into ice. So if you cool down water, to zero degrees, then it becomes ice, but the crystallization process has to start at some point in the water. So there must be some impurity which acts as the crystallization seed, and from there the crystallization can start. Now, if you um, have very, very um, water that is very, very pure, purified water, then you can actually cool it down below zero. And let's say you have now such a, a, a super cooled water at let's say minus one four, so minus 14 degrees Celsius, uh, in a glass cylinder in your lab, standing there, then the smallest perturbation in it can actually uh, make this transformation ice happen. So for example, if someone is coughed, <coughs> and the sound wave traveling to the cylinder and uh, hitting the cylinder uh, causes a small, uh, a small uh, impurity, and immediately the uh, water, the whole water undergoes this phase transition. And in this phase transition, it expands uh, uh, when it becomes ice and then it, it explodes this uh, cylinder. So it, uh, you shouldn't do that in your lab. You should be very careful to uh, isolate uh, supercooled water. And uh, such a phase transition happened with the universe. 
And there was also in the beginning some kind of um, uh, some kind of impurity. Uh, people talk about uh, 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 quantum fluctuations. So, um, uh, and then uh, this inflationary phase happened. And what we do now at uh, uh, the School of Chemistry and Physics is we have a team that investigates the afterglow of the universe, of the Big Bang of the universe, in order to find out what actually exactly happened. Okay, let me come to another example of uh, our research. And uh, this is research uh, about um, very small chemical compounds, so-called quantum dots. And uh, here we have a world first. We are the first, uh, um, the first um, department in the world, or is the first place where uh, we managed to produce these small chemical compounds uh, unsupported, so without a substance uh, in some kind of very small spheres. And you see here a picture from an electron microscope showing you the small spheres. And it says 3.45, um, uh, the units is nanometer. Nanometer is uh, uh, the size of 10 atoms is uh, one nanometer. So this might be 40 uh, something, 40 atoms uh, uh, big, these spheres. And now if you take a particle and uh, you, you, you confine it to such a small space, then inside the electrons that are in these, uh, in these uh, compounds inside, they um, become uh, different than what you normally see, namely in that they have a certain energy levels. So the energy of the electrons in these compounds is quantized, and by that I mean that they uh, come just, the energy comes just in certain packets. And that gives this uh, compound fantastic optical properties. You can use it for uh, these quantum dots for LED uh, lights, or you can produce lasers with them. Uh, you can use them in solar cells. And of course, the electronic properties are also very interesting. Uh, so you can use uh, quantum dots as single electron transistors in electronics. And uh, what we use them for here is uh, they help us to produce plastics that are more eco-friendly. So what does that mean? Well, you know that we have a big problem with plastics that decay and then they decay into microplastics. So there is lots of these uh, plastic uh, phasers around uh, and uh, they enter the food chain, chain and uh, um, cause a lot of problems. So another example of uh, the technique uh, in uh, producing uh, nanoparticles is uh, to put them actually together to nano rods. So what you see here is a little rod, and uh, this is the the, uh, the rod under a di under a, uh, an electron microscope, and it has the diameter uh, maybe of you see it here 100 nanometers, so so like 1,000 atoms, and these uh, rods can be used to actually crack and reform other materials. So you take these rods, they have a certain uh, catalytic property. You take them together with other materials, these other materials crack and then reform. And um, this is, for example, used to convert crude oil into petrol. So that's very interesting for the, for the oil industry. Okay, let me come to something uh, else uh, in physics, uh, namely, the idea to use um, to use very very small particles, so-called quantum particles, like these quantum dots, uh, and uh, load information onto them, and send them uh, uh, from a sender to a receiver in order to communicate. So we we, uh, uh, we use them as information carrier, and uh, the idea here is that uh, this this information is very. Um, secure against eavesdropping. So uh, these small particles are so sensitive that if someone would try to read out information, he would disturb the particle and disturb the state of the particle. And this state change could be uh, detected by the receiver. So uh, an example where this was tried out is uh, our department put uh, uh, such a, a sending station at the Moses Mabida Stadium during the World Cup in 2010 and communicated to the nearest police station in the CBD of Durban. 
uh, in a kind of re uh, proof of principle uh, experiment to show that in under real world conditions, we can actually use the small particles that are transmitted. By the way, these are photons, the particles the light consists of, and they are sent uh, through fiber cables um, uh, uh, to show that, uh, that, uh, that this is really a practical solution. Now, a different thing that you can do with uh, uh, quantum mechanics is you can uh, trap atoms. So you see here this metal cylinder and in the metal cylinder, there is a, a, a atomic trap and there are, there's a cloud of atoms and you can use these atoms for different purposes. And one of them is you can use them for atomic clocks. So atomic clocks are very, very precise clocks. Uh, they don't lose or gain a single second in 30 billion years. Can you imagine such a, uh, such a precise clock? And uh, why do we need such precise clocks? Well, uh, we, uh, we use them, for example, to synchronize GPS satellites that fly, that rotate, uh, 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 that orbit the Earth. And uh, if they are synchronized, then they can send very precise signals uh, in order to triangulate your position and you can use this uh, to find your position, to determine your position in GPS, with GPS. And every GPS satellite has an atomic clock on board by default. Okay, let me come to something else. Uh, another example of our research is research to, uh, uh, to form batteries. So this is, uh, uh, for example, if you have a cell phone or a laptop, then good chances that your battery is actually a lithium ion battery because lithium is so, uh, so light, light element. And how does this work, such a battery? Um, well, you have some chemical compound like it's shown here and um, the lithium, it contains some lithium and the lithium can migrate uh, to another compound if it's in contact with this other compound. And when it migrates, it leaves, away, it leaves behind one of its electrons, its valence electron. And uh, so if the lithium goes away, then if more lithium uh, uh, atoms migrate, then uh, the electrons that are left behind uh, negatively charged, uh, charged the one compound and the lithium uh, ions that are then positively charged because they lost one of their charges, usually they are neutral. So if they lose one, they are positively charged and uh, they will positively charge the other compound. And then if you uh, put a wire from one to the other, then uh, an electric current can flow. So you can use this as a battery and it's a rechargeable battery because if you put an external potential uh, to this, to these uh, uh, two layers, you see here these two layers, there's uh, layers in the battery and the one contains the one kind of compounds and the other, the other, uh, then uh, you, you can actually make the, the lithium ions to uh, uh, migrate back into the original compound and then the whole process can start again. You have charged uh, the battery. But uh, the problem with it is that uh, the battery can, of course, uh, be damaged. So if the structure here is damaged, then it cannot be recharged. You cannot, it's not reversible. You cannot bring the lithium ions back. And uh, you can investigate that under these microscopes, electron microscopes. And what you see is here a nice a structure, a hexagonal structure, uh, like for a battery that is uh, working. And here you have a battery that's not working so well, so something deteriorated here, and then it's not rechargeable. When does that happen? For example, if you discharge your battery completely, you might damage it. Okay, so this is interesting research, and a especially interesting point now that we investigate at our school is how can we uh, develop uh, other batteries that don't work with lithium because lithium is a, is a, is a, a scarce resource. It's difficult to get by. And uh, our idea is to produce sodium ion batteries instead because sodium is there in abundance if you live at the uh, sea because uh, sodium uh, is one of the components of salt. So uh, the idea here is to produce uh, sodium ion batteries and this is what we are researching. Uh, let me come to my last example of our research, and uh, this is in drug uh, medicine, um, uh, medical drug development. This is a very exciting field, but also a very difficult field. And we are very lucky that at our school we have uh, uh, two of the world leaders in, uh, in this field. 
uh, that, uh, that have a peptide lab and they um, train students and uh, give them the know-how to actually know how to develop drugs. And I want to shortly just uh, tell you what this process entails. And uh, usually, usually it starts with some uh, comp compounds, chemical compounds that you already have. Think for example of natural drugs. So you take uh, a drug from a, a, uh, so a chemical compound from a plant, some substance, and you, uh, you, 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 you start with certain substances and then you check whether they have the chemical properties uh, that are necessary to, uh, uh, to start a certain healing process. For example, maybe you are looking for something that, um, that fights microbes or bacteria or fungi or something like this. And uh, the first round is just in the lab, a preclinical round. You have, to, you have to test all these drugs and maybe you, uh, these compounds, maybe you change them a little bit. And after a while, you might have found uh, some of them and you take them then uh, to, to do uh, tests with mice. You have to test whether these drugs are actually safe before you can give them to uh, human beings. And often you have to go in a reiteration if something goes wrong. And so you have to go back to the drawing board, you have to go back to the lab. And eventually you might make it, uh, you might produce a, a safe drug, uh, but then you have to show that the drug is uh, really working well and so forth. And in the end, there are many iterations and the process takes 12 to 15 years to produce a single drug. Single medical drug, 12 to 15 years, and now guess how much it costs to develop this? It's about $800 million. And $800 million, that is, I don't know, 10 to 15 billion rand, it's a lot of money. And therefore, not many people, uh, you have to work together with companies to do that. And you have to have expert knowledge, and we have these experts. So in order to show you the timeline here, it is like this, a drug discovery in the beginning, in the preclinical phase, uh, where it's just tested in the lab, it takes three to six years and you start with five to 10,000 compounds. And after that, uh, you, after, you, after preclinical phase, you end up maybe with 250. So you select the 250 of them, maybe you change something in these compounds. And then you go to the clinical trials and the first phase, there are three phases. The first phase is, is it safe? You have to make sure that your drug is not dangerous. And of course there are side effects, but you have to, you have to really know what they are and whether you can take the responsibility to bring this on the market. And the second phase is the phase where it's actually tested on, on uh, uh, 100 to 500 volunteers. And in the first phase was 20 to 100. So, so you go up with the number, and the second phase is to show, does it work? Does it actually do what you think it does to fight the microbes or whatever? And the third phase is then you have to actually show that your drug is better than anything that already exists on the market. And that's very difficult. So um, once you run uh, successfully through these uh, three uh, phases, you might come down to a single component. And this single component, if you can show that everything is fine, uh, your medical authorities of your country can then approve it and it can enter the market after uh, a total phase of 12 years or uh, 10 years and uh, uh, 800 million dollars or 10 billion uh, rand. So uh, I want to um, uh, end here, but uh, not, not without mentioning that we have also uh, other disciplines or other researchers in our uh, a school of Chemistry and Physics, namely, uh, you heard it already before, uh, at atmospheric physics, analytic, and environment, environmental uh, chemistry, then uh, condensed metaphysics, uh, nanotechnology, and uh, also quantum computing. And if you are interested in these things, if I uh, could raise your appetite, then please uh, look at our homepage, you see here the, the address, or look at uh, the page that Sally already uh, uh, announced, the, day, uh, the page of the open day, you find a nice video about our research. Uh, the other possibility is you just search for YouTube and research at the School of Chemistry and Physics uh, on the internet and you find uh, this uh, video on YouTube. Thank you very much. With this, I want to give back to Sally. Thanks, Thomas, if you can stop sharing your slides and 
if I can have the School of Chemistry and Physics panel, if you can all uh, show yourselves. And we've got uh, just under 10 minutes left for questions uh, that have been posed. Uh, Thomas, your slides are still there. Um, but I will start with some questions, if I can find where I put them. Um, and this is a question that's come in, and I'd like to ask Intercausal. Uh, Intercausal was, was a science student. She's uh, got her master's by this stage. But she started off doing a BSc, and she did chemistry and physics. So Intercausal, if you can just tell us what it's like to be a science student at UKZN and what it's like to study chemistry and physics at university. Hi, hi everyone. So I did chemistry and physics in the first year only. However, um, I had the I was nervous about doing the course, especially uh, chemistry and physics, as it did give me quite a challenge in high school. However, when I got to varsity, it was very uh, student friendly. Even though I didn't understand most, um, initially understand the the two courses, uh, the two subjects the tutors, the lecturers, as well as the practicals, they gave me that confidence and, 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 and more and a better understanding of the context, especially um, the practicals. Because what you learn in class is what you go and do in the practicals. So it, it, it combines the two and makes it easy for anyone, even if you didn't have the practical experience in, in high school, when you get to varsity, it's, 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 it, it's seamless. Um, and maybe just tell us quickly, I know you were at Maritzburg campus, being a science student at Maritzburg, would you recommend it? Um, yeah, I would, but it depends on what you want. Um, you need to know that your day starts early in the morning. Most of your modules start at 7.45 every day and you end your day at 5 p.m. So, and you don't have time, if you see the school perspectives and you see people staying on the grass and chilling, that's not us. We don't, <laughs> we don't have time for that. So your day will be packed from the morning till the afternoon. And when you get home, you need to review what you learned in the day. Because if you don't do that, you will, not, you will be left behind because each day you learn something new and you never get time to go through a chapter more than two days, if you're lucky. Sometimes you go through a chapter in one day because at varsity, the lecturer just gives you the tools and it's up to you to go and learn and understand the module. So if you want to come to the sciences, it, it, please do come. We have a beautiful views and it's nice. We have support staff that are there to accommodate you. Uh, tutors who are basically postgrad students, so they, they they understand your struggle, and we have SIs uh, which are hot sessions, which are like uh, extra classes, and we have them available in Zulu and English. So it's it comes to UK the same do sciences as long as you know you're never gonna get time to play around, but in weekends you can do sports. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, and Kosa for those very wide wor wise words. Um, Tashana, just a related question. Uh, if you can tell me what the entry points are if you want to study physics and science. And also, I'm not sure if you're the person to ask, if you get below these points, a little bit about the access program, the access route. Uh, okay. Um... So the, uh, for applied uh, chemistry, and I think this applies to physics as well, uh, the points are between 28 uh, to 34. And I have a list here. You need to have maths, English, um, LO4, or agricultural science, or life science, or, or physics. Uh, but the entry points are between 28 and 34. So if you don't, uh, or if you haven't done uh, physics at school, uh, and you have this passion to do science, you want to do science, uh, then we have uh, the access program. So uh, they will review uh, 
uh, your whatever you've done at school and advise you if you uh, if you can uh, get into the program uh, but yes if you haven't done uh, physical science at school uh, you and you want to you can still do it uh, a bsc in science uh, via the access program it's a year it takes uh, it's a year longer so your th for a three year degree it's actually uh, it will be four years okay thanks tashana um ross a question for you maybe if you can just elaborate a little bit on possible job opportunities if you major in chemistry hey good afternoon sally and thanks first of all to my colleagues for their presentations this morning uh, uh, Sally, uh, it's a good question. So our postgraduate students uh, and our undergraduate students tend to find jobs um, quite readily in the market, uh, but unfortunately not too much in KZN. The, the chemical industry isn't that big. It's mostly in Gauteng and, and the Western Cape. Having said that, the, the industry does seem to be growing. The, the local KZN government is putting a lot of um, emphasis behind growing the, the chemical industry in, in the province, which is very pleasing. So I think in a few years time, you'll see the sector growing quite nicely. Um, quite a lot of our students actually get jobs outside of South Africa as well, strangely enough, uh, but they all come back, which I'm pleased to say. So they pop out for a few years and then, then come back. Um, but uh, I, I think, um, you know, obviously it depends on, on the person's um, experiences so a lot of our students don't just do chemistry and physics they, they do other things as well um, it's it's the uh, you know getting involved in uh, societies the community work and things like that and, and you know they get um, a lot of experience from that which sets them up very nicely for for their job job market thank you sally i forgot to unmute myself Thanks, Ross. Um, we've actually run out of time now, so I'm going to have to stop it there. There was um, quite a few questions about astrophysics, but I'd advise um, any of you who are out there who are interested in it, please tune in at three o'clock, which is the School of Math, Stats and Computer Science, which is where um, the astrophysics unit sits at UKZN, although there is a lot of overlap with the School of Chemistry and Physics, but I do know they're going to be talking more about that program. Uh, Sally, so I'm now going to say, yes, Ross. You also have astrophysics. It's important. To yes, know. I know so you also have astrophysics. Our website, we, have a, we, have a, we have astrophysics. So okay, it's... Thomas wants you to come to the School of Chemistry and Physics. They're fighting over you already because they know that the astrophysics students are, you, are the best you students. Fresh minds. Young okay. People. Thank you. All right, thank you to the School of Chemistry and Physics. Um, people who have been watching, if you can please remember to take our poll. We now are going to move over to the School of Engineering. So if I can say goodbye to our Chemistry and Physics colleagues and welcome our engineering colleagues.